Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel session on lessons from new research into civil resistance. Um, and we're very excited to have you here today and hope you're having a great conference. Um, today, we have four people who are key in research in the field of civil resistance. And for those of you who may be less familiar with that term, it's what we mean by uh, what's often called people power, nonviolent action, nonviolent struggle, nonviolent resistance. But it's a way people wield power to create change for rights, freedom, um, and justice um, through nonviolent action means. And we'll get more into that. So we um, are going to start with an overview of just what is civil resistance um, and a focus on what are some of the key research findings over the last uh, period. Um, and, th and that'll be with Hardy Merriman, who's the president and CEO of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict where I work as the manager of academic initiatives. And then we're going to have three scholars, one from um, Thailand, one from Sweden, and one from Ecuador, looking at recent research that they've started doing or have recently completed that will focus first on civil resistance against sort of a, a government, a state actor, um, and Janjira Sambhapusiri will um, give a, a description of her research that she's working on right now on that. Then Isak Svensson will be talking um, soon after that, um, giving a presentation about sort of proto-states like ISIS, who um, during the period where they had land in the caliphate, how people could deal with that kind of state using the tools of civil resistance. And then finally, we'll have Cecile Muli from Ecuador talking about research she's done about how civil resistance can be used by civilians against armed non-state actors that are harming communities or, or causing a problem. So um, we'll do those four panel presentations and it'll be 10 to 15 minutes for each one. And then we should have close to 20 to 30 minutes for comments. And so there'll be two ways to, to raise your questions. One is you can type into chat. And I would encourage you to type into chat as the questions come to you, because so maybe Hardy's giving the first presentation and you have a question. If you wait till the end, you might forget it. So feel free to type in questions as you go. Um, and then we will retrieve those at the end for the uh, question and answer period. Um, and, and then you will also have direct. So the main way to do that is through chat, but you also have the raise your hand feature, um, which I think is on the upper right of your screen, uh, where you can raise your hand and we'll look for that. And then we can make it available for you to, to speak with your question, and then we can have the panelists answer, answer that. So I think without any further ado, we will move to um, Hardy's presentation. Let's get that up. And let's do So Hardy, why don't you take it away? Great, thanks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining in. Thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, again, my name is Hardy Merriman. I'm president and CEO of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, ICNC. And uh, <clears throat> we focus on nonviolent movements around the world that are fighting for rights, freedom, and justice, with a particular emphasis on looking at the role of skills and strategy, trying to figure out what kind of skills matter, what kind of strategies are effective when people are uh, confronting um, oppressive political systems, uh, corporations, or other adversaries, non-state actors who are violent, uh, and civilians are 
waging using tactics like strikes and boycotts and civil disobedience. Um, so I have limited time, so I'm just going to dive in. My role is to set the stage and define a few key terms and then also talk about some sort of core research findings so far in this rapidly growing field. Um, so I'll, I want to define the term civil resistance. Uh, I'll touch on a definition of the term movement. Um, and then I want to also, uh, yeah, I'll go through key research findings. So what is civil resistance? Chances are when you think of that term, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is the image of a protest, right? So this is an image from Algeria last year of protest. This is one kind of protest image, the, the crowd. Here's another kind of protest image, the, the close up. Here's a third kind, the, the, the conflict image. <laughs> and these are all images we've become accustomed to seeing. Uh, protests are easy to photograph. It is one of the most common nonviolent tactics. And it can be tempting for people to think that civil resistance really consists of protests, that it is many people refer to protest movements as if what do movements do? Well, they protest, but they actually do a great deal more. I'm gonna show you another picture of a tactic of civil resistance. Here, it's not as clear what this tactic is unless you know the context. This is in Khartoum last year when people went on general strike. When militias were going around committing violent acts against people, people said, we're gonna stop the economy. We're just simply gonna stay home. A very powerful uh, nonviolent action, but if you didn't know the context, you might not know that what was going on here was, was nonviolent action or civil resistance. So if we're gonna have a definition, we need a definition that can bridge this and this and lots of other things. So a common def definition is drawn from the work of Gene Sharp, who in 1973 uh, wrote a very influential book called The Politics of Nonviolent Action, where he really said, look, there's, we can study civil resistance as a social science. We can look at what Gandhi did. We can look at the labor movement. We can look at the women's suffrage movement. We can look at uh, rent boycotts. We can look at, um, <clears throat> at a whole range of acts of nonviolent resistance and try and actually look at them from the perspective of what are the what are the sort of choices people are making and how are those impacting um, impacting the the outcomes of those movements. And so the first step of course is defining the term uh, civil resistance, which is actually a term that Gandhi created and 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 to try to describe what he was attempting to do in India. And so I'll sort of paraphrase the academic definition. It's civil resistance is a way for people to build power without using violence. And in this field, in order to study this as a mode of action, the, the concept of violence is fairly narrow. It's threatening or committing physical acts of violence uh, against other people. And so civil resistance consists of three kinds of acts. The first is acts of commission, where people do things that they're not supposed to do, not expected to do, or forbidden from doing, right? So protest when you're not supposed to protest, blockade when you're not supposed to blockade. The second is acts of omission, where people refuse to do things that they're supposed to do, expected to do, or required by law to do. So refusal to pay utility bills, divestment from banks, uh, consumer boycotts, labor strikes, uh, school strikes, school slowdowns, you name it, changing uh, patterns of social behavior, uh, withholding certain um, certain civil behaviors that are expected. There are social and economic and political forms of omission and commission. And then the third uh, category is a combination of both. This would be things like the creating of alternative institutions. So for example, if I um, started a school in my living room for students, for children in my neighborhood, and they pulled out of the official government school and started going to the school that I was doing in my home, that would be a combination of both, the creation of an alternative institution. And again, with credit to Jean Sharp, um, who really uh, systematically started to put this field on the map. This He used the term nonviolent action. I use the term civil resistance, but we mean the same thing. And, um, and, and his definition has stood the test of time fairly well. Though, of course, we can problematize it, but as this isn't a strictly academic conference, uh, we won't do that here right now. So um, <clears throat> moving on, what is a movement? Um, <clears throat> this is a term that 
gets used a lot, right? Politicians talk about movements, corporations sometimes talk about movements, organizations say that they're a movement, uh, the media labels things a movement. It's actually a tricky term to define because it's used and misused and appropriated. And for some people, it just means something's popular. And for other people, it means something much narrower. Um, so I'll give you a fairly wordy definition. We won't spend too long on it, but, and I'll actually highlight a few parts of it. Uh, movement is something that's sustained over time, right? So just a quick protest that happens and then sort of fades into nothing is not a movement by my definition anyway. It's ongoing. It's civilian based, consists of voluntary participation. So the the when we think about civil resistance movements, we're thinking about the ability to get large numbers of people to voluntarily change their behavior patterns in ways that wield nonviolent tactics and shift power, right? It's not so simple as an organization that has staff saying, here's what we're gonna do, and then the staff go execute the plan. It's actually the ability to get large amounts of voluntary behavior change by people that can alert society of certain issues, can educate communities, can serve people's needs, their economic needs, their psychological needs, or mobilize people or some combination of those. Um, so again, that core thing about movements that makes them tricky to define and figure out where the exact edges are is that they get voluntary participation. When people show up consistently and, and mobilize and alert and educate and serve, you have a movement. When people stop, you don't. <laughs> what is the line between when people do and don't? At what point does something become a movement is another thing we could problematize if we were in an academic conference, but I just wanted to try to give some kind of a definition here that people can work with. So what we see around the world, of course, is that civil resistance is, movements are happening all over. They're happening in India, for example, if people look at the, the farmers right now that are gathering uh, and protesting um, and doing all kinds of blockades uh, and disobedience around laws and non-cooperation um, that are unpopular with them. We can see it in Belarus. We can see it in Thailand. I'll just go through these just to give a sense of just how common acts of civil resistance are. We can see them used in democracies, in authoritarian contexts, in semi-authoritarian contexts. We can see them used in struggles for self-determination like in West Papua. We can see them led by women, led by men. We can see them um, <clears throat> against corruption for autonomy to protect democracy. We can see them for the rights of minorities and ethnic groups. We can see them around local elections. Here was a protest in Russia that happened last year when uh, local candidates were barred from running in city council races, for example. And, on. and these are just some large examples. There are many others that I can't capture here. And just to give a sense of what the research is telling us, this is from Erica Chenoweth. If you look at the rising incidence of civil resistance around the world, um, you'll see the number of new movements trying to confront governments and change governments is rapidly rising when you compare with violent uh, movements. So if you look at these striped lines here, that's the number of new civil resistance movements in a decade that are trying to get some kind of political transition and look at that compared to the number of new violent movements. And you can see over the last 30 years, a huge trend in terms of rising civil resistance. And it's a very interesting question to get into why that is. It also coincides over the last 14 or 15 years with rising authoritarianism in the, around the world. Some could argue that uh, increasing civil resistance is a response to rising authoritarianism. When institutions don't work, which is sort of part of a definition of how authoritarian systems work, people are more likely to engage in nonviolent forms of resistance outside of institutions, for example. So looking at some key research findings to date, I italicize some because there are so many others I can't include here, but the I'll talk just about a few sort of key findings that I think are, are are uh, accepted uh, well at this point. And the first thing is that civil resistance is powerful, right? So uh, the, a cornerstone of this claim uh, comes from research done by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Steffen, where they analyzed 323 nonviolent and violent 
uh, insurgencies or movements um, in the last 100 years from 1900 to 2006 to be exact. And in this landmark study, which one was award-winning also, um, they found that nonviolent campaigns achieve success 53% of the time compared to 26% of the time for violent campaigns. So that really, um, that study is now almost 10 years old, but it really changed the landscape of people's thinking here because the conventional wisdom was that violent insurgency was the strongest means to challenge a state. And this was showing that that's generally not the case. Um, and and certain and so <clears throat> that was a very big deal. Um, however, we can look at more recent research um, and see variations, right? Because the 53 to 26 percent is over a 106 year time span. But if we break it down by decade, we can see variations. For example, you could argue in the 1940s, civil resistance by that solid line was actually less effective than violent insurgency. Violent insurgency being that dotted line. But you look in recent decades, and it's very clear civil resistance is vastly more power, more likely to succeed at challenging a state than violence and insur insurrectionary violence. Um, but we can also see troubling trends. For example, the high watermark for civil resistance success rates was, six, was 65% in the 1990s. The success rate has dropped over the last decade to 34%. This is very, very troubling. It still vastly outperforms the success rate of violence at 8%. Um, but nonetheless, a decline of 65% to 34% over 25 or 30 years is very concerning. Um, and maybe we can get more into why that may be in, in, in discussion afterwards. We also find, and this is taken from Chenoweth and Stefan's work, that the average nonviolent campaign concluded in about three years, but the average violent campaign took about nine years to conclude. So this also flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which would state if you wanna speed up change, use violence, uh, what, what the data finds is actually the exact opposite. So a second key finding um, is that civil resistance is a powerful driver of democratic development. This is one of the most replicated findings in our field over the last 10 years. And just to share two key studies on this, we can see again, going to Chenoweth and Stefan's critical work, um, they found that after a nonviolent campaign succeeds in getting a political transition, there was a 57% chance of a democratic outcome five years later. Um, they looked five years after a transition because the year after a transition, it's far too confusing to figure out what the new stable state would be. But if you look five years after a transition, there was a 57% chance of democracy. Whereas after a violent insurrection succeeds, there was a 6% chance of a democratic outcome. Even uh, when you look at a failed nonviolent campaign, a nonviolent campaign that peaked and then and then declined and did not succeed in that time at achieving its stated goals, it can have residual or collateral effects that still lead to democratic development a little bit later. So they looked what happens after a campaign fails to achieve its goals. Five years later, they still found there was a 35% chance of a democratic outcome in that country versus 4% for when a violent campaign fails. Another key finding here is from the work of Jonathan Pinckney who looking at 331 political transitions over a 70 year period, excuse me, um, yeah, 70 year period, 1945 to 2015, basically says, okay, let's look at how many civil resistance transitions, CRTs end in democracy versus non-civil resistance transitions. This would be violent insurgencies, but also coups, negotiated top-down transitions, all kinds, foreign invasions, anything that's not civil resistance related that created a political transition. And you can see the comparison of how many end in democracy. And it's pretty clear that civil resistance, while having no guarantee of success, compared to other means by which democracy is achieved, is vastly more likely to succeed than the alternatives. And then the third point um, is that we find that civil resistance has proven effective even in highly challenging circumstances. So sometimes people will look at <clears throat> this earlier finding from Stefan Chenoweth and say, okay, civil resistance was more effective by two to one ratio at achieving political transitions, but I bet civil resistance emerged in cases where that were a lot easier. I bet nonviolent movements were up against opponents that were a lot easier. That's not actually the case. <laughs> Uh, a number of conditions have been tested. Um, we need more research in this area, but a number of different sort of environmental conditions have been tested to look at the prospects for movement emergence and movement outcomes, including regime type, how powerful a regime is, a regime's use of violent repression, 
foreign state support, uh, socioeconomic factors, and levels of ethnic fractionalization in a society. And it has been found that these factors don't determine the outcomes of these movements um, by themselves. <laughs> when you look at sort of conventional analysis, or sometimes um, people will think that, well, if a movement's up against a tough enough adversary, or if the conditions are challenging enough, the movement can never succeed. That's not what the research finds. For example, if you look at regime use of violent repression, we find that it reduces the success rates of a nonviolent movement by 35%. That's a significant decline in success rates, but it's not a 100% decline in success rates. And frequently um, people will assume, well, once violence is used against a nonviolent movement, the movement can't win. No, not at all. In fact, when we look at some of the examples I gave earlier, many of those movements uh, were subject to violent repression and sometimes harsh, extreme violent repression and still prevailed. Um, so what this leads us to is a growing view that skills and strategic choices are critical factors in movement success, right? It's not just the environmental conditions that matter, it's also the choices and strategies of movements. And for my last slide, because I know I'm at time, I just wanted to say there's so much more research uh, that we need. Um, we're going to hear from three great scholars today. Uh, a lot of the, the emergence of this field, at least as a scholarly discipline, focused on sort of movements confronting states, particularly dictatorships. And the the field that still is an area we need more research on, but the field has moved into so many different other areas, which is really exciting and interesting. And what I would sort of close with is that when people try to sort of put the boundaries on this field, well, okay, civil resistance might be able to work against dictatorships, but it certainly couldn't work against X or Y or Z or other cases. The minute people put boundaries on what nonviolent people can do, it seems like those boundaries get pushed and broken through. Um, and so again, we're gonna hear from uh, three scholars today who are doing really interesting and excellent research on a whole range of issues um, that are at the cutting edge of our field that are pushing the boundaries of what nonviolent people can achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hardy. Next, we're gonna go to Jen Jira, um, who will talk about civil resistance in the face of autocratic persistence. And her research recently is focusing primarily on Taiwan and Thailand. So take it away, Jen Jira. Thanks, Steve. And um, thank you, Hardy. That uh, was really um, comprehensive introduction to the concept and practices of um, civil resistance. Um, here in Taiwan is um, past midnight, so I should say good night. But that means all of this is over. Um, so without further ado, let's just begin. Um, so let me show you these two pictures. Um, these two are protest incidents. Um, uh, one took place in Taiwan in 2014. The other was um, in South Korea, 2016. But what these two protests had in common was that the citizens um, uh, protesting were protesting against former ruling party. In Taiwan, it was the KMT that used to rule the country in the uh, from the 50s to um, 2000. And then South Korea, it was the protest against um, uh, then President Park Geun-hye, the leader of the conservative party, and most importantly, the daughter of the military dictator Park Geun-hye, um, uh, Park Jung-hye. So in, in, in these two cases, um, it seems that uh, popular grievances were driven by concerns of democratic backsliding in young democracies. And um, the two cases are um, successful in defending their democracies against any size of uh, autocratic recapture. Um, but in other countries such as Thailand and the Philippines, um, um, they don't make it. And so um, what I wonder is that these um, cases belong to what we call the third way of democratization. And some of these uh, have made it um, in their defense against the comeback of autocracy, but others didn't make it. So this is my ongoing research, um, shedding light on the current phenomenon of uh, third wave democratization. And so 
let us first define two things. Um, one is um, autocratization, what is it? And then the second is actually the core of my research. What do I mean by um, autocratic persistence? So now uh, most of us are familiar with um, third wave democratization in which autocracies change to electoral democracies from the late 80s to the 90s. And actually Yahara Hardy already touched upon that a little bit. However, um, from 2010 onward, as you can see uh, here, um, at least 62 out of 91 third wave democracies surveyed in 2017 have either stagnated, regressed, or broken down. Um, with regards to the existing literature of uh, civil resistance and democratization, my puzzle here is that civil resistance as the mode of democratic transition may guarantee some extent of uh, democratic consolidation after the transition. However, this prerequisite condition alone is not sufficient to explain ongoing backsliding in strong cases of civil resistance transitions such as in Serbia or the Philippines. And so these two countries and Serbia being my PhD um, thesis um, is now facing um, actually uh, in Serbia, particularly the return of um, autocratic regime. Now, for this reason, um, my research seeks to explore the interaction between civil society that is empowered by participating um, in democratization campaigns and um, remaining autocratic networks that have survived the transition. And so basically the idea is to look at the moment um, after the transition, this long process in which civil society try to reform institutions and whether or not these reforms uh, uh, make a dent into changing the power relationship between new democratic order and um, uh, lingering um, autocratic power. And so um, I want to make a case that uh, without these reformist campaigns by um, civil society, um, autocratic network networks could come back and recapture the political regime and therefore um, uh, democratic backsliding auto, auto, or, or what we face as the autocratization. So now moving on, um, by autocratic persistence, I imply former autocratic networks such as those in the armed forces, the courts, um, ruling parties, former ruling parties or state, um, state enterprises that used to serve under the previous um, autocratic regime prior to um, democratic transition. But despite the transition, they remain um, in power and um, they drawn on their re residual um, influence to roll back democratic gains at some point. So these networks thrive in the interrelated spheres of electoral and bureaucratic system, um, the economy, military, and norms, which are resilient to democratic changes. So um, just a, a, a short example in, in Taiwan, where I'm doing field research right now, um, the former ruling, the KMT, um, was the party state. So it actually ran almost everything. It ran the economy, it ran the military, it ran the, the education program. And so um, the, 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 the short moment of democratic transition could not actually um, change or uh, have uh, much impact on the this extensive power of the KNT. And so um, I can tell you more how I um, uh, show us my case studies, but basically it's four cases from Asia. And um, I start with uh, the cases that suffer some, from similar conditions of um, uh, structural conditions that uh, induces um, autocratic persistence, but then the the, the um, subsequent trajectories of these countries um, are different. And so today I will focus on Taiwan. Um, if we have some time left, I will just uh, touch upon Thailand a little bit when it comes to comparison. And so. Um, Taiwan and Thailand actually uh, transformed from uh, former autocratic regimes um, at about the same time in 1992. There were uh, two democratic legislative elections in this country. And so um, 
after this period, um, there were a lot of uh, reform programs imposed um, um, and implemented in the two countries. And um, here's, uh, here, here's the list of um, programs of reform that I believe um, that actually the existing literature assumed to, um, uh, to, to be able to deal with autocratic persistence. As you can see here, um, in Thailand, the reform program focused mainly on electoral reform, while in Taiwan, the reform programs uh, were much more holistic. And where I circle uh, were the areas of uh, uh, civil society uh, participation and actually pushing for reforms in these institutions. And so there are um, five pathways involving two groups of actor and two types of mechanisms that shape Taiwan's civil resistance against autocratic persistence. And so um, I, I still haven't done much field research in Thailand. And so what I'm going to present right now will focus only on Taiwan. First, um, NGOs and social movements um, in Taiwan serve as policy entrepreneurs by using extra institutional methods to demand um, reforms that I detailed earlier. And because these reforms require congressional deliberation, legislative passage, um, and uh, policy implementation through um, new democratic institutions, the NGOs and social movements drew on um, extra institutional repertoires, not only to set um, the agenda for policymakers, but they also mobilized um, constituents of, you know, of these lawmakers and sometimes political parties in order to monitor and put pressure on policymakers who were reluctant to accept and implement reformist policies. Accordingly, the mechanism driving um, this activist mode is defined um, as political assertiveness, but it should be noted that um, the use of extra institutional methods such as rallies, strikes, or um, uh, occupation of sites um, was never to bring down a nascent um, democratic order, but rather to correct and improve it. In this way, street protests, for instance, did not lead to delegitimizing democracy, but rather to deepening it. So the third, fourth, and fifth pathways are shaped by what I defined as hybridizers. Um, who are these people? Um, hybridizers are activists who have allies in power or a former activists who became lawmakers or ministers. Contrary to a conventional wisdom that these actors are co-opted by political parties and the system, um, they rely on both institutional and actually extra institutional repertoires to drive policy changes. They work in tandem with activist colleagues as well as their um, allies in uh, respective institutions. Unlike activists who remain outside the institutions, these hybridizers have access um, to the institutions that enables them to directly influence policy making process. Um, but when institutional repertoires are effect ineffective, these um, hybridizers may opt for extra institutional methods such as rallies to mobilize constituents for policy acceptance outcome and implementation. So the mechanism underpinning hybridizers um, is defined as political mediation with an aim at directly configuring um, democratic institution while shipping away at the influence of former autocratic network. And so um, my point here is that um, when uh, you have a young democracy, um, you will see the, the role of um, civil society actors using nonviolence methods, not only outside the institutions, but also inside the institutions. Now, um, in the case of Taiwan, this series of reformist activism has created two prong legacies that underpin the 2014 mobilization that I just um, show you the picture against the size of autocratic recapture. 
First, the activism contributed to shaping institutional reforms in the way that diversifies the center of power on the one hand and dilutes sources of remaining autocratic influence on the other hand. As a result, despite uh, the KMT, the uh, former ruling parties, um, dominance in both the executive and the legislative bodies between 2008 and 2014, um, the party could not significantly roll back democratic gains, partly because of the party's receding strength. Second, Previous reformist campaigns reinforced the advantage of institution building and corrective uh, activism as a way of uh, consolidating, of deepening uh, young democracy. Um, the 2014 movement demands uh, were not to overthrow um, the KMT government, who was actually uh, uh, elected um, democratically. Doing so would undermine electoral institutions as a way of peaceful transfer of power. Rather, the movement first had exhausted all institutional methods prior to that shift to rallies and occupation of the Congress building. Although militancy agreeably um, characterized parts of the campaigns, the movements were largely nonviolent and more importantly addressed the flaws of nascent um, democratic institutions. All in all, Taiwanese actually waited until um, 2016 to vote the KMT, the, the former ruling party, out of power. So here's my last um kind of uh, attempt at uh, comparing Taiwan and Thailand while not actually gathering enough data in Thailand. And so um, in, in the case of Taiwan, you will see that the institutional building and corrective uh, activism with the goal of addressing autocratic residual has become a um, necessary condition for countering autocratic persistence. And this one condition uh, combines with two other conditions that existed, um, which are the, uh, uh, the you know, reformist faction within the former autocratic networks and um, um, organized opposition party. And so compare this with Thailand, um, Thailand lacked both um, organized opposition party and this kind of activism. And as a result, um, um, there were no um, substantive reform uh, programs that actually try to tackle um, the autocratic leftovers from the previous regime. And whatever reform programs civil society in Thailand participated in uh, were uh, dominated by the reformist elite agenda who did not really want to overhaul the whole system because they had a stake in it. And so um, what happened in Thailand was that because of this, um, the absence of these two features, um, uh, Thailand experienced the pro mass protests in 2006, and the the uh, the old elites managed to hijack these mass protests and set the stage for military coup, and that gave way to the comeback of authoritarian governments ever since. So that would be it from my part. Thank you so much, Jen Jira. And I would just say, if anybody has questions that are um, striking you now, feel free to type them into the chat. And next up, we are going to go to Isak Svensson, who has done um, significant research on how organized civilians can use civil resistance to confront the caliphate, the jihadist governance, uh, nonviolent resistance. So take it away, Isak. Thank you so much, uh, Steve, and I'm um, greetings from Stockholm here. It's uh, evening. Uh, it's very dark because of the warmth. We don't have any snow. And I'm going to uh, talk to you about civil resistance occurring in situations where we might not expect it to happen at all. And this builds on parties um, um, note about the, the challenging conditions. So one of the most challenging conditions for civil resistance is when confronting jihadists in, in state, in, in jihadist proto-states. 
We have seen over the years an increase in number of armed groups that are using self-proclaimed Islamist goals, uh, transnational Islamist goals. Last year in 2019, more than half of all armed conflict, intrastate armed conflict, were between a government on the one hand and a group on the other hand, which had links to Al-Qaeda or ISIS more than half of all the conflicts in the world. And uh, increasingly, we have, we have seen these groups also setting up state formations. There are different terms used for this phenomena. Uh, Brynja Lee, a Norwegian scholar, used the uh, term jihadist proto-states. You could also talk about uh, radical Islamist rebel governance. And uh, Brynja Lia defines it in terms of territories declared as emirates, Islamic states or caliphates, and that are controlled and governed by militant jihadi groups. Uh, I would argue that these are, uh, to some extent, similar phenomena to other types of rebel governance structures, but there are also uh, some particularities with uh, jihadist protostates. They are similar in the sense that they are armed groups committed to governance. So they are engaged in armed activity, but also in institutional building and control over territory. And they have aspirations to be like a state, uh, to assert control over a population and to insert a, a, a political order. But of course, this political order is different from, from other rebel governance examples in the world. So when we talk about jihadist proto-states, they are aimed at applying Sharia law and as a way of waging jihad. They also, poured, so in that sense, they are not only political phenomena, it's also a religious phenomenon. They're also part of an international movement. And that I think is an important insight when we study these types of jihadist protestates that um, the jihadist movements is a global phenomenon. And when they set up protostates, that's local manifestations of a global movement. These are also known for using high levels of uh, repression and violence. Um, and also for making that violence very visible. Civilians can respond in, in different ways. And in a study that is just coming out uh, uh, very shortly in um, European Journal of International Relations, we look at the three cases with different types of responses. So in Mali in uh, 2012, uh, 2012 there was a, a lot of nonviolent response, civil resistance. Here is just one example from Gao in May 2012, where locals form a protective belt around the ancient tombs. Uh, but there were other demonstrations and acts of, of non cooperation where the Malayan, Malayan civil society, including women's organizations, played a critical role. So, nonviolence is one one response. Of course, there are other responses as well. And, and uh, in, in the second example here in Iraq, we saw, and this is the, the predecessor of, of Islamic State, uh, the Iraq, Islamic State of Iraq, uh, you could see a response by a militant response. So here, in this case, the, the, the tribal networks were militarized and they fought back against the jihadists. In Yemen, uh, in relation to the AKAP uh, jihadist groups, you could see a third possible response where civilians actually accepted the jihadists. So in our study, we tried to understand the, the variation between these three responses. How come that civilians sometimes protest against jihadists, sometimes fight back violently, and sometimes accept them? Uh, and our, our basic finding is that it depends both on the resource mobilization 
the possibilities and their grievances. So it depends on the, the level of civil society that are activated in resistance. And we could see in, in, in Mali that um, the civil society played a key role in resisting, whereas in Iraq, it was the tribal networks that were the key actor that got activated. We can also see that grievances play a, an important role in, in explaining occurrence of, of civil resistance. And one of the key things here uh, is this transnational movement. So what um, trans, the, the jihadist movements are, are, as I said before, they are a transnational movement and that can create tensions with the local constituency. They can be perceived as alien as a foreign uh, uh, actor, uh, which trigger response, uh, trigger uh, different responses. We have also uh, conducted research in Syria uh, to look at the occurrence of, of protests uh, against different jihadist groups. Uh, and using Arabic speaking, um, uh, social media, we have found 624 instances of collected nonviolent civil resistance against jihadist groups. And just that figure alone, I think, um, testifies to the fact that there is a lot of things happening. Six Over 600 protests against jihadist groups in the midst of a civil war. I think this is a, a very strong empirical fact underlining the, the potency and the the occurrence of civil resistance also in very difficult uh, situations. We measured this at a uh, village level, uh, and you can see here that it took place in 152 different locations. Uh, and I think that's point, important to point out that um, many occur in the same place. So many are, in a sense, movements. They are not only sporadic uh, demonstration, they are actually occurring over several several uh, days or uh, over time um, and, and part of a more concerted effort. And when we look at sort of the, the possibility for actually achieving what they set out to achieve, we can see that uh, the fact that they are occurring in the same place or in a context where you have other other groups protesting as well, is one factor that helps to explain why they become successful. We can also see that uh, past resistance has a positive effect, increased the likelihood of them being successful. In civil resistance literature uh, research, we talk about the concept of political jujutsu, that sometimes re uh, uh, repression backfire. Uh, and this we can see some evidence of here as well. If the groups are resilient and can maintain their protest activity after being repressed, met by repression, they're more likely to actually go on a more, uh, go on a more support. The type of, of uh, protest here has varied. Uh, so 37 of the protests were uh, sort of directed against stopping, stopping the fights. 20%, 26% about that the group should leave the city and 7% about the release of, of prisoners. Here you can see an example of the, the phenomenon that I just uh, described to you, the sort of the success driven of a political jujutsu. This is from our, our team that have interviewed people in, 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 in Syria uh, in the beginning of this year. HDS members, this is one of the, the jihadist groups, HDS members tried to repress us in several ways when they did. More people joined us and refused them. It's actually backfired. In 2016, one night, HDS arrested several civilians and activists in an attempt to stop the growing demonstrations from getting more momentum. But it had a rather different result. The next day, we stormed their headquarters and kicked them out of it. We have also studied this more in detail uh, on an individual basis. And we compiled in two years ago, October, November, 2018, the first survey of um, 
responses against ISIS in Mosul. Uh, we surveyed 1,024 uh, residents of Mosul and asked them about their experience of living under ISIS rule uh, and how they reacted. And we sort of presented a whole set of possible resistance strategy to them uh, and asked whether they had participated in, in any of these. And when we then categorize these together, we can see three different types of, of resistance strategies. The first one was the least common, and that's the public public demonstration. So when Hordit uh, talk about demonstration as being the most visible form of, of civil resistance, that's true. In this particular context, it's not particularly common. Uh, and that's for quite obvious reasons. These uh, ISIS did not tolerate uh, demonstrations and, and showing of slogans and occupation, occupation of public spaces and so forth. Uh, some of these also occurred online. The, the other one is the sort of non-cooperation uh, acts of omission, if you will. So these are sort of withdrawing um, the, 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 the cooperation and the, the uh, uh, refusing to engage in the uh, ISIS state formation project. And one of the most common there is the, the quitting of schools and university. 37% uh, responded that they had uh, engaged in that uh, type of activity. So that was the most common. But the, the, the most common uh, form of resistance is what is called the everyday resistance. And these are private, um, not necessarily political acts that where people are not fully com uh, complying with the rules and the mandates of the jihadist in power. Uh, so not uh, praying or participating in religious services, working slowly, 20% uh, reported listening to non-religious music and so forth. Acts that are underlying the legitimacy of uh, IS, IS rules. Let me uh, wrap up <clears throat> and draw some conclusions. And I think it's important here to point out potential policy implications. And the first and overall conclusion here, and which is in fact one of the underlying motivations for us doing this work, is to show that civil resistance is possible and can, under some circumstances, even be successful, even in these extremely repressive conditions uh, against these groups that have a sort of a religious and transnational uh, uh, characteristic. Um, and I think it also points further to that we have to have this broader take on civil resistance. Uh, not only look at it in terms of um, protest, not only look at it in terms of withdrawal of cooperation, but also these more subtle forms of sort of resistance in, for, in everyday life and how our, our people live out their uh, acts of resistance in their private life. Another important policy implication that I think our research point to is the importance of civil society networks. And that stands out in, in, across all the studies that we have done here, is that when we see people that are connected, that have connections to civil society organizations, they are the ones that can help to organize uh, civil society resistance uh, and civil resistance. Uh, and the last thing I would like to point out is the importance of actually highlighting these experiences to report the experiences of civil resistance so that others can learn from them and that, that that can inspire other protests. And in fact, we have seen, as I reported, when it, when, res, when civil resistance spreads locally, it stand, tends to become more successful. Uh, I'm happy to communicate um, more on this research. If anyone is interested, uh, I've led a whole group of people that have been engaged in this multi-year task of trying to uh, map out and understand civil resistance against jihadist groups. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isak.
And again, if you have any questions for this particular presentation that we could refer to Isak when we get to Q&A, feel free to type that into the chat. And next we will go to Cecile Muli talking about uh, civil resistance. Uh, let's see, Let me, there we go. Um, against armed groups who aspire to be rulers but haven't achieved success. Take it away, Cecile. Thank you very much. Well, in this presentation, I would like to discuss how we can extend our current understanding of civil resistance to contexts of armed conflict when civilians engage in nonviolent struggles against armed actors such as the one, for example, that Isaac mentioned, but maybe more broad. So much of the academic work on civil resistance has focused on nonviolent struggles against colonial powers or authoritarian regimes. And in the 1970s, as uh, Hardy mentioned, social scientist Jean Sharp developed a detailed theoretical framework to explain these kind of processes. He argued that civil resistance worked by shifting power around, and in, in his view, power should be understood relationally. That is, the power of the rulers depends on the consent of the civil resistance is a struggle between two forms of power, as we can see on this slide. So, in other words, when there is an asymmetric relation of power between two inter interdependent groups, where A oppresses B, if B withdraws its support to A and reduces its dependence on A through a process of nonviolent resistance, B can leverage power of So that's basically what, um, what I'd like to use to sort of extend to uh, situations of armed conflict. So the first strategy, withdrawing support, can be referred to as non-cooperation, and citizens can withdraw support in different ways, depending on the sources of power on which their opponents rely. For example, they can withdraw their economic support and therefore deprive their opponents of material resources by, non by, by not paying taxes, for example. They can also withdraw human resources by going on strike and so on. The second strategy, increasing one's autonomy from oppressors, can be achieved by creating alternative institutions or mechanisms. And that's what Gandhi called the constructive program. And that's, for example, what Kurds have done in Turkey, where they have established their own schools in their own language, or what people in India did when they began to wave their own clothes to reduce their dependency on England. In addition to this, a third strategy for citizens to increase their leverage over their opponents is to garner external support, and this strategy is all the more important as opponents depend on external actors and are sensitive to external pressure. Yeah. So let's now turn to situations uh, where civilians have engaged in uh, nonviolent struggles against armed actors. Uh, they, they've done so for a number of reasons, for example, uh, to avoid forced conscription, to protest against abuses by these actors, or to reject, simply reject the rules imposed by these actors or the violent means to impose these rules. So what happens in this kind of civil resistance protest uh, processes where civilians have to face very often different kind of opponents who are both state and non-state armed actors? I contend that the relationship between armed groups and civilians is often one between rulers and rule, and that, like dictators or colonial powers, armed groups who seek to govern people or territories depend on civilians to achieve their objective and exert their will. Even in territories where multiple armed actors operate and none has dominant territorial control, we can think of them as aspiring rulers who, at least to some extent, aim at receiving some sort of collaboration from local communities. Therefore, in such settings, the fundamental theory of power that underlies Sharp's understanding of civil resistance applies, at least in general. So if we can extend, extend this basic theory of power to contexts of civil resistance against armed actors, similar mechanisms apply. I will now turn to these mechanisms in more detail, emphasizing the specifics of civil resistance against armed actors. So first, 
I will discuss how the three strat strategies just discussed work in this kind of nonviolent struggles. Second, I argue that armed actors weigh four different types of considerations when responding to civil resistance by local people, political, security, normative, and economic considerations. And I do this on the basis of insights from various research projects on the subject con conducted in Colombia since 2013, including three case studies where this kind of struggle has taken place. In similar ways as in other types of civil resistance processes, when civilians collectively withdraw their cooperation from armed actors, armed actors' capacity to rule lessens. Here I included a quote from a former Colombian paramilitary that illustrates how this works in practice, and especially how broad participation and unity increase the leverage of civilians. Non-cooperation particularly works when civilians take advantage of relations of dependency to exert leverage over warring parties. One case in point from my research was the threats of the residents of a Colombian community to displace from their village should the guerrilla continue to sow mines on their main way of, act of access to their locality. All the villagers had displaced, the army could more easily have attacked the guerrilla. The ge guerrilla therefore paid heed and accepted to demine certain areas and relax some re restrictions on the movement of civilians. A second strategy is for local communities to increase their autonomy. For instance, by engaging in participatory budget planning, which involves the direct participation of local inhabitants in the allocation of funds for development works in their locality. This part of the civil resistance campaign of one Colombian community that I studied, and it aimed at preventing the insurgents from requesting funds for public works. As I will discuss a bit later, this indirect strategy has also been effective and insurgents accepted it even if it deprived them of some material resources. A thir third strategy for civilians to enhance their power relative to armed actors is by obtaining external support. In another Colombian case study, for instance, the fact that the church and the OAS, the Organization of American States, supported the initiative of declaring the community as a peace territory was one of the reasons why the guerrilla accepted that the rules associated with the establishment of a peace territory, including the cessation of any form of collaboration with any armed actors in the locality. So why did these strategies work? In order to understand why these strategies work in such context, I would like to dig into the considerations weighed by armed actors when they are faced with civil resistance from local civilians. First, I argue on the basis of empirical evidence from the three case studies, including interviews with former combatants and local residents, that non-state armed groups have political objectives and often care for their image. Therefore, they are ready to abide by civilian demands if not doing so would undermine their image and hamper their political project. And here I have um, a quote from a former guerrilla commander that illustrates this, and um, another one later from the same community who reinforces uh, this point. Second, I claim that armed actors also weigh security considerations since they depend on civilians for protection. This is so at least for two reasons. On one hand, these groups may avert attacks if civilians share information with them, or at least do not do so with their adversaries. On the other hand, combatants can seek refuge among civilians to avoid being targeted by their opponents, since very often opponents are reluctant to provoke massive casualties among civilians, lest this could damage their reputation and reduce civilian support. And the example, of the threat of displacement mentioned a little earlier can illustrate this. Third, I argue that armed actors take uh, normative considerations into account. And by normative considerations, I refer both to the need for armed actors to abide by certain normative principles that stem from ideology or other sources, for example, culture or religion, 
and social distance pressure. That is how perceived closeness between civilians and armed actors and hence the leverage of the, of the former over the latter. Academics such as Gutierrez, Sanin and Wood in particular have emphasized the importance of armed groups ideology, which dictates that certain actions are right or wrong and therefore impedes on armed actors' behavior. Meanwhile, Johan Galtung's great chain of nonviolence theory states that the shorter the social distance between grievance groups and their opponents, the more leverage these groups can exert on their opponents through civil resistance. With the concept of social distance referring to the perceived closeness between two individuals or groups. That is what Kurt Schock refers to as the moral dependence of the oppressors on the oppressed, when the short social distance between the two increases the pressure from the, from the latter. In all case studies, my colleagues and I found many evidence that these considerations were key to explain armed actors' response to civil resistance by local inhabitants. For instance, in one case, FARC and ELN guerrillas decided to stop fighting against each other in one area following local resident, residents' exposure of the inconsistency between the insurgents' stated intention to comply with international humanitarian law and their actual behavior, which caused undue harm to civilians. In another one, when villagers protested against abuses by FARC by exposing the contradiction between the guerrillas' discourse and their actual behavior, stating in particular that killing people is not revolution, but destruction, they succeeded in having FARC take measures to address wrongdoings. The guerrillas' acceptance of participatory budget planning in the example that I mentioned earlier provides another example of the weight of normative considerations stemming from rebels' ideology and care for their public image. In that case, local resident, residents used this strategy since it would be antithetical for the guerrillas to tap into municipal funds or request money for civilians from civilians to undertake development projects. Indeed, if the guerrillas were true to their words and strove for the development of the community, they would not hamper the implementation of projects put forward by people themselves to enhance their living conditions. Additionally, the data collected pointed at armed actors' increased likelihood to respond positively to civilians when the perceived distance between them was short, regardless of the, these actors' ideology. Relations of vicinity, family ties, similar political ideas or religious beliefs could help overcome the divide between combatants and civilians. More specifically, our data illustrated armed actors' reluctance to harm people perceived to be close. As this statement uh, by a former paramilitary uh, testifies. This is consistent with the findings of various social psychology and civil resistance studies, which contend that armed groups are less likely to harm less socially distanced people. people. Fourth, we found some evidence that certain Armed actors also weighed economic considerations when responding to civil resistance, albeit to a lesser extent than other kinds of considerations. In no case studies, this applied to non-state armed actors only because they were the ones who depended on civilian cultivation of food to operate. In one case, for example, the guerrillas likely gave in when local farmers protested against being taxed twice by different guerrilla groups for fear that these farmers would refuse to pay altogether. So in conclusions, a research on civil resistance against armed violence in context of armed conflict shows that like in nonviolent campaigns against authoritarian rulers or colonial powers, the opponents, in this case armed actors, cannot rule only on the basis of coercion. They need civilians' obedience to achieve their political objectives gain or maintain territorial control, guarantee their personal security, and obtain certain resources necessary for their struggle. Our findings have practical implications for civilians who aim at reducing abuses by armed actors who depend on local people for political, security, normative, or economic reasons. 
First, they support the arguments made by scholars and practitioners that both participation and unity are paramount for civil resistance in such contexts since a massive withdrawal of consent can seriously affect these actors. Second, mobilizing external actors can be useful to reduce the level of abuses when armed actors depend on such actors. Third, civilians can take advantage of social ties with armed actors to overcome their civilians' combatants divide and obtain concessions. In the future, it would be interesting to test our findings in other cases to appraise their validity in relation to different war contexts and types of armed actors. For example, armed groups with distinct kinds of end degrees of political, security, normative and economic dependence. In the meantime, I hope that this attempt to theorize civil resistance against armed groups as aspiring rulers helps us to better understand these kind of non-violent struggles and how they can be supported by external actors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if the other panelists can turn on their cameras now and their audio, that would be great. Um, the, we have a number of questions that have shown up in the... Uh, the chat box. And the first one, because many of the people who are watching are practitioners, not researchers. Um, and so one is from a participant in Bangladesh who is talking about how difficult the situation is in Bangladesh. And I think this is a maybe a good question for you, Hardy, um, given that uh, ICNC, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, is an educational foundation. What resources are available to local activists and organizers around the world that could help them um, increase their strategic uh, savvy and the kind of resources, educational resources they need? What kind of help could groups like ICNC provide? Sure. Thanks, Steve. And thank you for the question. Um, a few thoughts. Uh, the first thing is, as I frequently say, activists have one of the most important jobs in the world, right? And if that wasn't clear ahead of time, though, I suspect it was because you're, you're all at this conference, but it certainly should be clear after we look at the data about just how important the, um, the actions of nonviolent activists are to securing democracy. And by that also human rights, better governance uh, and so forth. And so it's one of the most important jobs in the world and it's one of the hardest as well. Um, if we're going to say that skills and strategy matter, that raises the, the question of what kinds of skills and what kinds of strategies. Uh, the good news is that if skill and strategy matters, it means that we can learn it. We can all get better at it. Uh, the tough news is that is it raises the question of what are the learning opportunities? Uh, what is the infrastructure available for activists and organizers to tap into? to learn from experiences around the world, to learn uh, and get mentored by each other, uh, to learn from uh, great scholarship and so forth. And so um, we really face a challenge in this field of a lack of educational infrastructure for activists and organizers to do this incredibly important work. Um, and it's our view that if, if, if that exists, if there's more opportunities for people to learn, that it really will change movement outcomes. And so on, on this point, um, ICNC, one thing that we do is we've created a resource library. Um, perhaps Bruce can put the link in the chat where we have resources in over 70 languages, uh, including in, in Bangla uh, or Bengali and um, in, in many others around the world. Uh, where people can download resources that may be useful to them. Um, and we we really put an emphasis on translation for this purpose. We also have online courses. We're actually launching an online course soon uh, that's available to people around the world. Um, and we, we, we pride ourselves on the fact that in these online courses, um, first of all, the evaluation data shows that they're really impactful. And second of all, they convene people from struggles in different parts of the world to learn from each other, not just from the material in the course, but also to mentor each other and learn from each other. So those are a few thoughts. And uh, if the person who asked the question would like to follow up separately, uh, you're welcome to email. Thanks. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. Um, another question, which I think might be for the other three panelists that we could get your different perspectives, but one participant referred to yesterday's session where uh, Dr. Vernique du Douay was talking about the integration of nonviolent resistance with uh, within peace building, dialogue, negotiations. And so given your studies in these various settings against uh, governments, proto-states, or armed actors, are there elements where you have seen in your case studies where peace building skills are used alongside of civil resistance skills? So I would just say any one of you who's got examples of where the combination has proved helpful, that would be great. Uh, I can say a few words uh, from the, the work that we have done. I think it's important to recognize that uh, when there is a sort of peace building post-conflict activities in the Iraqi context after the end of, of the IS occupation, much of that Policy program, my sense is that it's based on an assumption of civilians being either perpetrators joining up with ISIS or victims of ISIS. And what we demonstrate in our study is that the picture is more complicated than that, that civilians also have another role. Uh, they have agency and some of them have taken quite active measures working sort of underneath the radar and, and sort of undermined ISIS uh, state formation project. And I think that creates sort of a, an important entry point for peace building programs to realize that this uh, potential for civil resistance is there and it has been there and it has been used. Uh, and, and it creates a different way of looking at the recipients of, of sort of, of different programs and how to relate to that, which I think is, is really central. Thank you. Um, I, I have an example from my um, previous research in the Philippines, which looks at um, um, security sector reform in um, peace agreements um, in the Philippines and, you know, compared with um, other Asian countries. And um, one of the things that struck me was, um, I mean, the, the peace agreement between the Philippine government and the um, NLOF um, was, I mean, it was an official framework and the government established these official mechanisms to uh, monitor ceasefire and, you know, so on and so forth and to reform the whole police and the, the armed forces. Um, but also there are um, um, civil society initiatives. Um, they do not necessarily fall into um, the category of uh, civil resistance, but um, the, some of the um, civil society groups form their own ceasefire monitoring um, scheme. And they um, basically uh, did that work in parallel with the um, the official uh, ceasefire monitoring. And I think um, they always uh, sort of came up with their own data with contrasted with the government sometimes. And they kind of showed the society that, you know, look, the program is not working right now. And, you know, at times, you know, they call for the improvement of um, ceasefire monitoring. Excellent. Cecile, are there any examples of using peace building skills and strategies alongside of nonviolent resistance in your research? Yes, they are very often actually in this kind of armed conflict context, people use both a civil resistance together uh, or in a complementary way with negotiation, mediation, and so on. And there are various uh, there are multiple examples uh, where, where uh, we can find that, uh, where local communities actually reach out to uh, armed actors and negotiate with them or mediate for the release of, uh, of civilians, for example, who've been uh, kidnapped by, uh, by these um, actors or, or try to mediate in order for armed actors not to harm uh, certain peoples, for example, who are allegedly allegedly accused of collaborating with adversaries. So there are plenty of examples where uh, 
um, where people, for example, use negotiation and mediation in addition to uh, civil resistance in a complementary way. And also, I think that when you think about, for example, these kind of strategies, uh, mechanisms uh, to create alternative institutions, actually, uh, these are ways for people also to address structural violence, cultural violence, and there are also ways to build peace in some ways. For example, I was giving you um, uh, earlier uh, an example in, uh, in Kurdistan, where uh, the Kurds have uh, developed their own school systems. Uh, this is also a way to do peace building, in addition to do civil resistance. So plenty of examples. Excellent. Thank you. I think the other thing, going back to Hardy's point, is that m movements involve many organizations in different sectors of the population. So it's not just peace building skills are useful in dealing with um, an opponent of the movement, but building coalitions often takes negotiation, really deep listening and peace building skills. Um, another question that a couple people have raised is what is the impact of, of social media? Isak, you mentioned that directly, that people in your examples in proto-state caliphate situations with jihadists, people will often use everyday resistance or non, or non cooperation, but they're less likely to use just sort of uh, lots of very public concentrated things. But you had mentioned social media, but I think for all four of you is, you know, what is the evidence where social me media can help build a movement and increase the capacity of civil resistance? And are there any downsides to uh, sort of collectivism uh, and and social media use that 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 pr practitioners should be aware of? Uh, if I'm allowed to start, I, I think uh, this is a really important point. And uh, one one thing that we were a bit surprised on in our research is sort of the difference of the extent to which international media picked up on social, on civil resistance activities against jihadist states. So in the first iteration of our study, we relied on data from the, the international news agencies, which we as conflict studies uh, scholars often do. Uh, and we found only a handful instances of, of protests, some of the most well-known uh, protests against jihadist uh, groups, so a handful. When we shifted empirical strategy to instead uh, screening social media, we found so many more examples. So this testifies to the role of social media spreading role, spreading information uh, about these types of activities. And there I think it has a, a really important role. I don't think social media can help to explain why it, it can occur but it helps to explain its spread. Thank you. Any other thoughts that any other panelist has on the pluses or minuses of social media and civil mm, um, I, I have a, a quick um, kind of um, insight on, on the ongoing experience in Thailand, the protest. Um, I, I think the role of social media is very important when it comes to um, countries with shrinking um, civil society space, like, you know, in authoritarian contexts or actually in, in armed contexts as well, where, you know, um, public kind of um, demonstrations uh, are not available, right? And so people usually take to social media to um, address their grievances. And um, in the case of Thailand, uh, uh, we lived under military dictatorship. Um, for five years, um, um, uh, uh, only up until last year, uh, where there was an election, and you know, during these five years, um, uh, protests were banned, and also, um, you know, um, all kinds of uh, public actions were were illegalized, and so. Um, you know, um, people, um, I think, try to um, build this kind of sense of solidarity in social media and try to figure out what they could do together um, in terms of symbolic actions, in terms of um, online protests. And I think what we're now seeing in Thailand is the transfer of this online 
actions into offline actions and most uh, more often than not you know like um the crossover uh, blurs the line between online and offline spaces and i think that's um um the advantage of social media but the downside of this is two things one is that once you um, overly rely on social media um, in this um, shrinking space. Um, countries, um, the, the repression on social media tends to be intense. And so you are exposed to um, digital crackdown by the government. There are a lot of uh, draconian laws uh, that would kind of uh, um, uh, provide the pretext for the government to to kind of uh, arrest uh, people just simply posting something online. And the second thing, I think this is related to um, um, Erica's uh, latest um, article that Hardy um, discussed. I think the the over reliance on social media makes it difficult uh, for movements to build a kind of consolidated. Um, um, organizational structure and, and this experience of working together. And I think that um, the, the re one of the reasons why we see the decline in um, effectiveness of uh, nonviolent movement is that now we have a lot of protests that uh, happen in social media and then um, they transfer to offline um, space. But these protests do not necessarily mean that protesters have already built a movement. And so the protests uh, are quite uh, uh, the surface of, of all this, you know, lack of uh, uh, organizational structure. Let's make a quick comment. Uh, going on what Jinjira said, I would agree very much. Um, we have a significant rise in the number of movements we're seeing internationally over the last few decades, and we're seeing a declining success rate of those movements. And I think there are lots of reasons for this. I think authoritarians are getting better at confronting movements. There's lots of reasons, but I think social media and, and the internet is part of that story. It may be that the internet and social media enable you to get more mobilization that is less successful <laughs> on average. It may be that, I mean, we know that you can put an issue on the agenda through social media. You can also misinform through social media, which is a whole other thing. So, I mean, the short answer to the question is it's really complicated and no one really knows. But when we assume that a movement's using it well, they can alert people on social media and they can try to get mobilization on social media. But mobilization, when there's not a broader set of sort of trust and, and unity that's developed ahead of time, sometimes it doesn't go very far, right? Because if everyone shows up because they have a grievance, but they haven't figured out how do we make decisions together and what's the basis of our unity, then you get a crowd that doesn't necessarily know what to do next. And so there's no substitute for building unity, planning, nonviolent discipline. And if you do those things well, social media might be quite helpful, but it will never substitute for that deeper strategic work. Thank you. Cecile, is anything in, in your research uh, factor in about where social media can be useful or, or potentially ineffective? No, I very much agree with what uh, Janjira and Hadi have just said, so I think okay. I don't have anything to add. Great. Well, another question that came up actually from a couple of different people is different ones of you talked about sort of domestic withdrawal of support in a, in a localized situation or in a, in a nation. But some of you also mentioned the impact of external, the shifting from external support to, to non-cooperation. And so the one question was just, you know, how does this impact the shift between, you know, domestic actors and external actors outside of the country? And I think we can frame it a little like social media in terms of in what ways can external actors be helpful or are there ways that external actors actually hinder the effectiveness of that, of just sort of weighing, you know, what is known from the kinds of research that you've done. Does anybody want to take a stab at that? Great. 
Go ahead, Ginger. I thought Cecilia wants to say something. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. Um, um, so just quickly, I, I think that um, it depends on which external actors you're talking about and um, in, in, in what context. And I think in, in Asia, and I think that applies for other regions as well, um, there's a growing um, um, discourse on uh, Western support of domestic pro-democracy movements. And I think that is um, counterproductive. And so I think the kind of over um, support of, of these um, homegrown movements would tend to be counterproductive. But what is um, interesting right now in Asia is that there is um, uh, um, what we call Milk Tea Alliance, which is more like a, a regional uh, bottom-up um, alliance of pro-democracy movements uh, spanning across um, Hong Kong, Thailand, Taiwan, the Philippines, um, and Indonesia, um, and now India. And, and these are basically um, a new approach to looking at how um, regional um, actors can share their experience. And, um, and I think that when it comes to kind of um, regional support is more difficult for the regimes to kind of use the discourse of like Western plan to kind of overthrow um, their regimes so on and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Susia. No, I, yeah, I agree with uh, with Janjira too, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, external support can be uh, manipulated uh, to delegitimize a movement as externally driven. But when uh, the opponents, for example, a regime or armed actors, depend on certain external actors to succeed in having these external actors reduce their support or even withdraw support from um, the opponents can be a very useful strategy to uh, shift power around because uh, we know that many armed actors uh, regimes depend on on certain type of external support so it's just a matter of of uh, thinking strategically and doing it in a way that hinders uh, your opponent's support while not delegitimizing yourself Excellent. Anyone else have a thought on this question about what kinds of external support can be helpful or? I'll make a one minute comment. Um, the first is that if we follow the research, skill, if skills and strategy matter, we can orient external support towards um, skill building um, and trust building opportunities and mentorship opportunities for activists on the ground. The second thing is listen to what people are saying on the ground. The third thing is that if you go in, have a theory of change. Supporting movements or supporting civil society is not just an inherent good. It's not like we just support them and good things happen. Have a theory for how that's actually going to happen. Because if you don't have a theory, what tends to happen is people think that throwing money at the problem is going to help. And money can actually be detrimental. Movements can dissolve over accusations of who's profiteering for money or over, over corruption or various other well-documented negative impacts of funding for when a movement doesn't have the infrastructure to absorb it. Have a theory of change if you go in there and um, and, and listen. And um, if it's of interest, I put earlier a, a blog series I did on human rights funding and movement support, uh, which makes some of those points and a few others. Great. Um, which gets to the last question that I think before we close up, because we're about at time, but people were wondering, are there ways to get a hold of the presentations that each of you have given? Um, and so I just want to say that people can, um, let's see, um, there's more resources available on the ICNC website. People can contact me. Um, as sort of a conduit, and I can check with the panelists about um, uh, sending out the presentations or maybe more publications that they've done on the topics, if people have interest. And the, the final thing I would say is this is being recorded, so uh, everybody who's a participant in th this whole conference will get access to the recording. So you can go back and re review it as well. 
And with that, I just want to extend my thank you to Issa, Cardi, Jenjira, and Cecile, and for all the participants who joined in today. And we really appreciate your joining us and hope you have a good rest of the conference. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And thanks to Steve and Bruce as well for their work organizing this. Thanks, panelists, and thanks, everyone, for coming.